We're going to keep a bit on the theme of electrification of uh, battery technology. It is my great pleasure to uh, welcome up uh, Mujib Ijaz. So Mujib is the founder and CEO of Our Next Energy, um, also called One, a Michigan-based energy storage company. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Um, so Mujib has, uh, as well, brings a wealth of experience with background and career. Um, he was with Ford uh, for, for many years. I think you and I might have even overlapped there um, in the battery alternative powertrain program. Uh, he was president of A123's uh, venture technologies business here in Massachusetts, developing lithium ion battery solutions for EVs. Um, he was more recently a senior director at Apple, which I know from our conversation in Munich, we're not allowed to talk about. I'd just love to say that. It's top secret. So, and then uh, now uh, he's gone on to found this um, wonderfully successful uh, company. And I, I should congratulate you, Mujib, because this week Mujib became a father. Now, not what you're thinking. Not what you're thinking. <laughs> So he gave birth at the One uh, Circle facility in Michigan to the first uh, battery to come off of the line there. So yeah. congratulations so, on, the, on that. We're, we're excited about that. Yeah. Okay, and I think you have some slides we as well. So, uh, John, me... thank you so much for that. When I posted my LinkedIn, I said, you know, when we think about this new battery factory, um, it's like taking pictures of your firstborn first steps. Everyone's super excited, so that's the way our employees felt this week. We just started producing our Michigan-made cells, uh, LFP technology. It's great to be with you, and as we think about uh, establishing energy storage here in the United States, it's not a new subject. As Boston Power, and you've described very carefully, uh, lithium-ion battery technologies and, frankly, a lot of the nickel metal hydride battery technologies that were developed have been birthed here. What's really new is our ambition, the recent ambition, to industrialize and to actually build the factory's supply chain and vertically integrate those supply chains together. That is, <clears throat> I'm in the meeting now. Um, that is the new ambition. So what I want to talk about today is a bit of a, a bit of an overview or even a look back of where have we been with respect to battery technology, and then how has that sort of given us lessons learned to figure out where do we want to go? Now, our company is around 400 employees. We're based in Michigan. We do have an R&D center in Fremont, California, and another one here in Boston in Bedford. And as we're thinking about scaling this 20 gigawatt hour factory, if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> we, we sort of took a look at one of the most important factors in a battery technology and a company being successful, and that is making sure that the battery delivers on attributes and range is on the top of the list of attributes when it comes to what's important for batteries in electric vehicles. Now, the early history of batteries around lead acid and even going back as recent as the early 90s, that 100-year lead acid era produced electric vehicles that had about 100 kilometers of range. Even going as far back as 1900, Electric vehicles have always, in that era, <clears throat> been struggling to get over the 100-mile or even get beyond that 100-mile barrier. Now, in the you know, early history, electric vehicles didn't have the regional requirements. In the middle history, in sort of the 50s and 60s, the metro areas were growing. But in the recent era of the 90s, electric cars with 60 miles range did not represent anything that the public would want, want to have anything to do with. If you go to the next slide, we entered an era of 200 kilometer range when lithium ion came out. And there are really two successful lithium ion efforts here in the United States. One was around Nissan Leaf. The second one was around the LFP technologies that Yet Ming Chang founded here at MIT and really gave birth to such an important company, A123 Systems. And the little box that I put sort of circles what was available and possible at the time. But I'm going to point out something that if you look back in history, we should take a lesson from. 
The early electric cars were kind of small batteries shoved into the gas tank area and converting a gasoline car to an electric car. That was not a very successful idea because you were limiting yourself in range right off the bat. That battery that was in the Chevy Spark was a battery that A123 did. And as I worked with GM to design that battery, we had 110 liters of volume. Tesla's battery in the Model S was 420 liters of volume, four times the size. In that difference, we could have made up a lot of ground on range, even with the early LFP batteries, but we lost that ground because there wasn't an ambition that electric cars were a real market. It was a compliance market. The early ambition of the auto industry here was compliance, not that we were making the future energy transition and that we were birthing energy transition. If you go to the next slide, the next very important event in the history of electrification recently was the advent of the Model S. The Model S was the first vehicle that crossed 500 kilometers or 300 miles of range. And that, that was not only important from the standpoint of recruiting a market, but also rethinking the vehicle altogether. The platform itself made the battery bigger, 4X bigger, as I mentioned, but also drag coefficient was very low, so you could drive at higher speeds and not lose your energy in just highway driving and drag coefficient. It also rethought weight, because if your battery's like 40% of the weight of the vehicle, you need to make the vehicle out of lighter other materials, so you have to rethink everything. It was the first attempt that was successful at rethinking everything. And as, as that battery was developed, it was also part of the equation. It's successful chemistry and energy density using nickel cobalt was very high energy. The small form factor, I remember being in the auto industry at the time in Detroit, and everyone saying and thinking, why would you put 8,000 cells together? That's a ridiculous idea. It's using laptop cells is what a company does when they don't have the investment capability of doing it, you know, quote unquote, right. But actually what it did is it limited failure mode. You had a chemistry that was very volatile and you limited the failure mode of a risk of a thermal runaway to a small four amp hour cell. That became important if you go to the next slide. And by the way, I'm plotting this against energy density. It's sort of the truth chart of battery. You can't escape that chart. System level energy density, not cell, but where's my system? Because system density is how big the battery is, how much does it weigh, and that's effectively going to give you range in a vehicle. As the auto industry moved to bigger cells, larger cells, 60, 70, even larger than 100 amp hours, using nickel cobalt manganese, nickel cobalt aluminum chemistries, and moving nickel up to get more energy out of the cell to get to better range numbers, they were getting better range numbers, but actually a single cell event was leading to a fully destructive vehicle level fire. And not just one vehicle. There was a case in um, a recent um, uh, event that happened in India where 80 vehicles caught on fire because one vehicle on charge caught on fire. Another case that happened that was not fully resolved as whether the electric vehicle started the fire was the Dutch ship. But in fact, as the vehicles caught on fire, they caught each other on fire. The idea of thermal runaway became more news because recalls were happening. And when recalls happen, that's a massive financial obligation. It's also met with a lot of consumer confidence erosion. But the third thing is the executives that have made big decisions don't like making big decisions that result in massive losses. They're unlikely to make that same decision again. So you go to the next slide. When we think about what's the anatomy of thermal runaway, what's not actually talked about, and, and yet McChang might correct me on these numbers, so I want to know whether I got these right or not. A third of the cathode mass in nickel cobalt is oxygen. And as that point is not often talked about, it is the single most important factor in why nickel cobalt chemistries lead you down the possibility of a risk of thermal runaway. Because once you have that much oxygen at play, it just cascades through and you don't need anything to do more with respect to spreading that fire than all of the ingredients that are within the cell. Now, how did the fire get started? It might be a short circuit. It might be a manufacturing de defect. Actually, as an engineer, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to say, if the fire gets started, then what happens? You're not worried about how it got started. In the context of that, this oxygen level is way too high to really ever prevent that from being a catastrophic failure. So if you go to the next slide, what, what I thought about in kind of 2020 pandemic, March of 2020, starting to work from home, starting to have 
a little more walking time with my family and sort of thinking about why am I actually in California, what am I doing, and what's my impact, I decided to really start thinking through the next decade, where would electrification go on the current trajectory? And I wrote down three problems. One, I think range was massively still misunderstood. I was taught as a Ford engineer that we needed a 100 mile EV and that that was gonna be the market because it was 700 miles a week if you charged every night. We had a great narrative, but actually it didn't work out. The, the market didn't care. Well, really a 300 mile electric car is in a little bit of the same boat because if you drive at highway speeds at zero degrees centigrade, you can make that 300 mile EV do only about 180 miles. You can lose 30 to 40% just in two conditions. Drive on the highway and do it in winter. Well, we're in Boston. You guys definitely understand winter. And then drive on the highway. Go, the metro highway, the metro trip is one type of trip, but when you actually wanna go somewhere and your range not, is not available, that's the problem. So we looked at range as one, and we wanna double the range as a goal. We looked at safety, thermal runaway or nickel cobalt as a second problem. In fact, cobalt also has a supply chain problem. And then developing the North American supply chain, a sustainable supply chain. If you go to the next slide, <clears throat> We then analyzed through NREL a very, a very excellent report about the green cathodes or sustainable cathode materials. And iron is really the abundant material that's been used in batteries since you know, Edison's nickel iron battery and, and the work in the early 1900s. Iron being abundant and being low cost, those go together, abundance and low cost and then supply chain security. Nickel and cobalt have doubled in price in 12 months. The last 12 months, the volatility of these two materials has been quite high. And thermal runaway, we've already talked about. If you go to the next slide, what we thought about is that LFP done right with a bigger battery could actually get you up the ladder on range. Now Tesla introduced the Model 3 with a, uh, a lithium iron phosphate or LFP battery working with CATL, and that gave about a 250 mile range capability. But I go back to the real world problem. 400 kilometers quickly can become 200 kilometers and now I'm back to 160 mile EV if I drive at highway speeds at the wrong temperature. So in fact, <clears throat> that itself wasn't enough. And so what we did at Our Next Energy, if you go to the next slide, is we started rethinking, if you go to the next slide, please. We started rethinking this idea that electric vehicles that were on a journey in the early 1900s, and that journey stopped. Why did it stop? It stopped for the fundamentals of cost and range, the range of electric cars back then weren't enough to man manage charging deserts. I read many articles back in the day, and going to Upper Peninsula, Michigan, you could never get back because you could not find a place to charge. Those charging deserts are still a problem today. As we look at the possibility that we're at the exact same place 100 years later, we're at the chasm again, and many people think electrification is foregone conclusion, done deal, and it's gonna happen, but I think the range problem is still a problem that we need to overcome so that real world range gets you that regional trip of five hours of driving without worrying about any problems. So if you go to the next slide, our fundamentals in terms of battery technology are giving us two approaches. One is LFP only. And we've been able to match the best performing nickel cobalt batteries through mechanical engineering and system design. And then we worked on a dual chemistry where every day you use LFP and then you have range extension through a special technique of eliminating graphite, doubling energy density, and through a limited lifetime, but a very successful battery for energy, you can move the energy to the LFP battery and extend range. In that way, we're, we're offering now 400 to 600 miles of range. And that's our approach. We actually fundamentally believe in the idea that electrification is here and it's permanently here, but we wanna overcome the topic of the barriers that have been there in the past, Energy density is the single best way to drive cost down. More energy, less materials drives cost down faster. So that's our approach. We're at 400 miles with LFP, 600 miles with dual chemistry, both of which have been demonstrated in vehicles. I'm really excited to be with my dear friend, Yet Ming Chang, and um, we're gonna talk more about batteries, I understand, John. So Please. I'll uh, let this be the last slide, and uh, thank you guys very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Mujib. Please uh, stay up on the stage. Um, could I invite uh, Martin and Yetming and Christina back up to the stage, please? Um, you can go right there at the end. And we'll put uh, Martin right here, and Christina and Yetming in the middle. So, 
let me just let me just quickly cue this up. So last night we were at dinner, and uh, somebody asked me, "Hey, what do you think of solid state batteries?" And I said, "Well, I, there's probably about a hundred people in the world who can answer that question." We need backup power. <laughs> <laughs> that was right on cue. <laughs> I guess there's not a bright future for solid state. Um, okay, so. Out of those 100 people, I probably four of them are are right here. Um, so, you know, this is this is one of these crazy things that we're doing here at the Vision Day. We're going to try to do a micro panel on battery technology, and with really, really uh, incredibly uh, thoughtful expert people. Christina has already been introduced. Mujib has been introduced. Um, Yetming Chang was mentioned, Professor uh, Yetming Chang, Professor of Material Science and Engineering here at MIT. Um, yes, I mean, uh, uh, sort of a legendary uh, member of our faculty here, co-founder of A123 Systems, uh, co-founder of Form Energy, a grid storage company, co-founder of 24M Technologies, uh, which makes battery production equipment. And to guide us, uh, we have uh, an equally illustrious uh, faculty member here at MIT, uh, Martin Bazant. Martin is professor of chemical and uh, chemical engineering and mathematics at MIT. He's the director of the Center for Battery Sustainability here. Uh, he's chief scientist for Lithios, which is a startup company that he co-founded to develop advanced lithium extraction from brines using electrochemistry. Okay, so here we go. So 20 minutes, let's cover the world of battery technology. <laughs> Martin, over to you. Great. Well, thank you for the for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. An honor to be here, actually, with uh, with the members on stage. Uh, so we don't have a lot of time. I think this is kind of challenging. There's a lot of things we could talk about. We could talk about the transition to LFP, which I'm personally excited to see because I've worked on that as a scientific problem for the last 20 years, and it's finally uh, uh, really uh, coming back in an industrial way. We could talk about supply chains. Uh, we could talk about sustainability, something I'm very interested in as well. So sort of end of life, or how do we have circularity of these different materials, um, and also how do we do all this domestically. So those are some of the ideas we, we could talk about. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, we could start with you, perhaps. So are you asking me what I'd like to talk about? Yeah, so you maybe have a pick, uh, <laughs> I mean, we don't have a lot of time, so pick what do you think, well, if there's maybe one topic you, you could tell us about. And maybe, maybe, maybe if I could just suggest, the, the one thing that really people in this room need to understand about battery chemistry, that you guys understand super well, but we don't. What's that one thing? Oh, well, okay, so uh, what are the limits? What are the limits in, let's say, energy density? All right. I'm going to tell you a little story. There is a, you, you all know about an agency called ARPA-E. Right? <laughs> and recently, there was a call for proposals. It's called Propel 1K. 1K refers to 1,000 watt hours per kilogram. And uh, so uh, Mujib's slides show that today we're pushing in EVs about 250 watt hours per kilogram. So what is 1K about? 1K is about planes, trains, and ships. Right. You need 1,000. And uh, the new RPE director is a colleague of ours, uh, Evelyn Wang, who used to be uh, the, ch the head of the mechanical engineering department. She's now the RPE director. And she said, to one of the, uh, the program director for Propel 1K. I don't understand why it's 1K, because you're telling me that the theoretical energy density of some of these chemistries are 3K and 4K. How come you're just asking for 1K? <laughs> and uh, so shouldn't you be asking for 3K? And, uh, and so we're trying to explain, so how do you explain why it's so hard? Uh, and uh, so, well, you know, if you ask for 3K, you're not gonna get a lot of plausible uh, proposals here. And so until now, the highest, uh, the highest target for electric vehicles has been battery 500, which is 500 watt hours per kg, double uh, that 250, and to double that again. And so there's this great discounting, but maybe to put it in perspective, the chemistries that we know of today, battery electrochemistries, uh, the top end is about 4,000 watt hours per kilogram. And what we're all trying to do is to figure out how to make those uh, usable, low cost enough, and by the time you get to a system, have something that uh, is, exceeds what we're doing today. So I'll, you know, I'll just pause there for a second and we can uh, talk about that and maybe uh, other things. Actually, 
maybe speaking of systems, you could you could jump in here on. Yeah, I mean, I think that framing is really good. For example, what's the theoretical limit of um, energy density, and then how do you turn a system that's practical? Practical for the automotive world is 15 years of capability and life. Practical for the grid is even longer, 20 years. So it really gets into pairing durability plus performance. And maybe the thing that we're starting to realize is, why don't we partition batteries into segments? The thing you need every day, and that's really good at the like sort of workhorse level, the thing you need once in a while that's really good for recruiting the whole market to deal with the outliers. Because the outlier condition, whether it's a temperature or a range or any outlier, if you end up trying to hold up the whole train for the outlier, you can wait 10 years to fix that one outlier spec versus maybe pairing two chemistries together. So we invented an electronic set that can do 99% conversion efficiency from energy source to energy source so you don't lose a lot and that you can make it in a small enough package. So that might be a way that we can start pairing. And I want to pick your brain about the 4,000 crowd. Um, that sounds good. Uh, but, but really pairing the, what batteries can do with the, what we need it to accomplish at a system level should become maybe at a higher level a systems problem. Because if you solve it only at the chemistry problem level, you constrain yourself. If you solve it at a system problem level, then you can adapt the system with multiple functions out of different parts of the chemistries and systems that you put together. Yeah, I want to comment on, uh, on systems as well. I think it's very important uh, as we bring a lot of innovators into this space right now, we attack it where we have strength. Ultimately, as users, you don't care. <laughs> you're looking at a range, you're looking at a deployment time, you're looking at a use cycle, you're looking at ultimate costs, both of acquisition and over time. So I think the call to action there as users and as co-participants as we shape these systematic transitions is to look a little bit beyond the headlines. So we can have opinions about the most recent chemistry headline or the most recent product introduction, but actually taking it into so what and with what time frame. So I think one of the topics I would like to bring forward is this, uh, I would say, dissonance between the innovators' interest in creating something very important, like the academies, like MIT and others, where we look at basic research, it's critical. Yet, we stand at times of geopolitical tension, uh, of climate change, of all kinds of gender and equality and, and social issues, where now is the only time that matters. So having the opportunity to look at a system, so maybe more obvious in energy storage, if you have a high energy density cell, but it gets packaged into a rack that has to be in a container with five different vents. And because it has a high explosion risk, you have to have a large distance where you cannot put any buildings or any people. All of a sudden, your actual energy density is really low. Exactly. When we look at explosion rates, why don't we go back to first principle? How much gas can you actually generate? And one of my pet peeves right now when we look at systematic change is what standards are we testing to? Today, my friends, we have UL standards that are not measuring the intent of the test, where the industry has an ability to go around and engineer products to a test. That's pretty terrible. And for people like us that think about first principle, we got to voice this very, very clearly. And we have to find a way to make safe, low cost, and performance just right. Nobody wants to overpay. We can't be disappointed. This is a movement that we're entering into. So systematize and data truth is, I think, two very, very important headlines together. Well, myself, more of a scientist working in this field, I've been involved in um, you know, lots of interesting chemistries, and I've been observing all various chemistries also that have been hyped over the years. Think of lithium air, lithium sulfur. But in the end, it seems like certain kind of more practical chemistries that are well understood, they keep maturing, they keep getting better. And so I thought maybe I would put to the panel, uh, what are your thoughts about the innovation? Are we going to be getting that sort of new material that's you know 4,000, as you just said, yet? Or are we really going to keep seeing more development of, say, LFP? LMFP, other blends, you know, sort of more incremental change, and especially the systems level uh, part is, I think, very important, actually. There's so much uh, innovation that can happen there just without really changing the chemistry that much. So. Yeah, uh, 
So uh, what I, the reason I mentioned trains, planes, and ships is because they're also transportation. And I think that it, it would, you know, uh, why am I focused on that? Well, it's a you know, hairy, audacious new target. Right? So, and that's what makes it exciting. Right? And so uh, there's, there are also a couple of other things about you know, that form of uh, tr transportation that are really different from cars. You know, you buy an electric vehicle, you have this giant underutilized asset there, the battery. 400 mile range, 600 mile range, and you drive 20 on a daily basis. Right? And when you move to something like, so an airplane, so let's say you electrified airplanes, right? uh, you have to have enough reserve capacity on board to get to the next airport. Right? And yeah, yeah, you have enough reserve capacity on board your electric vehicle to get to the next couple of states, not the next town. Right? And so it's, you know, it's actually pretty inefficient the way that we do this. And you know, uh, trains, you know, a freight train, how much excess capacity would that need if you electrified it? I mean, essentially zero. Trains, for the most part, run on time. You know exactly where you're going, when you're going to get there. Right? And so I think that you know, I've been thinking about this. You know, EVs are crazy. <laughs> we can't, you know, this is this great underutilized asset. A lot of consumer, the only th thing that's a, a greater underutilized asset than <laughs> so certain consumer products is scientific instrumentation. We buy these million dollar microscopes and the capacity factor is like 3%. Yeah. <laughs> so in any case, for what, for what that's worth. <laughs> I think it's also interesting to think about economics. So we steer behavior through economics. And uh, I am now very curious about this idea that I can help lower the cost for the battery technology hardware and couple it with software that is, again, just right. And we've put a lot of effort into trying to make that intuitive. So not only can you have an inefficient battery potentially, but if you could trade it, if you can participate and do virtual power plants and participate in energy where it's needed, where you happen to be, if you carry it with you or if it's stationary in your house. What if we have batteries everywhere and you have a virtual power plant that is connected and all four of us on stage just get a signal it's like, hey, hey, grid is getting unstable. Would you like to participate? We pay you a hundred bucks. We would all say yes, because we're not using it right now. We can opt in, we can opt out. The United States, again, is putting trial states in. Massachusetts is thinking about it a little bit differently than Connecticut, which is a little different than New York or California. And that's interesting. We're experimenting together. And the tool of economics is so critical. And the clarity when we get into these systems inspire us, of course, to also participate. So as users and being alive at this time, we owe it to each other to not only step in and be part of this, but share the data and try to develop this together. So economic tools, I think, is the other innovation in this. Big finance coming in, the fact that you can have a battery that somebody else owns and you can leverage, you can lease it, is a sign of maturity of this industry. I can build on that, that uh, an electric school bus earned during a summer $10,000 by trading energy to the grid. Mm -hmm. And that's a very significant single summer kind of evidence point that there is a way to like um, not have a stranded asset if you have the capability of now tying virtual power plant ideas together. Microgrids, fully islanded, it's another topic, uh, being able to run industrial centers with solar storage. And so from my perspective, very much about figuring out how to put the merger of transportation and stationary uh, together and tr try to create more value. Great example of that is if you go backwards now 15, 20 years, the idea of a phone was a communication device. Then it started evolving and having additional features. Then public, the PDAs that were just like the Palm 5 um, information machines, that came together in a smartphone platform, which brought a couple different ecosystems together then the app store started creating new businesses. Well, I think of the battery technologies that we're working on in much the same way, that we have a transportation sector, then you see stationary storage trying to get lifted off, but actually the merger of them is coming. And when the merger comes and people can get value from their stranded asset, like during lunch, your phone pings you and says, how, do I, how about I pay for your lunch? You know, someone wants to buy a little energy and are you good with that? 
that is a really important set of ideas that can enable a future business model and then also accelerate the willingness to adopt. Because everyone's trying to do cost parity on a car for a car and you know the grid uh, batteries that are going into stationary storage are solving very specific problems. But when you, when you think about a smartphone, we're all paying a lot more for phones than we ever did before, but they've integrated five, six, seven, ten functions that now we can't live without. And I think that's where we would like to drive this energy transition is how do we get business models and integration of function to play together in a more seamless way. We come back to your original question. So we went off in that direction and talked all about systems, how we can better utilize not only individual devices, but the whole system. Back to the original question, do we need new chemistries or are we going to go a long way with the uh, existing ones? And what about solid state batteries? Right? So uh, I think the, you know, the, the biggest change that's occurring right now is actually getting rid of the negative electrode. And what I mean by this, so the term, people talk about the, quote, anodeless battery. And what does that all mean? You know, these uh, alphabet soup cathodes we all talk, that, that Mujib talked about, LFP, NMC, they all come originally loaded with lithium. That's the source of the lithium you're using. And then we have you know, a, a, a negative electrode. And historically, you've had a negative electrode like graphite, or you've put a lithium metal electrode there. But it turns out that if you make the battery efficient enough at shuttling lithium back and forth, you don't need that negative electrode at all, right? And so that's what's called, quote, anodeless. And, uh, and so this approach is being developed both for liquid electrolyte batteries, but it may be especially well suited to the solid state uh, battery. And that's really where the, the, I think the excitement is because that's at the cell level. You, know, you can probably get a 50% jump in energy density uh, if you do that. Right? And so I think that that's a way to think of uh, all of these different effects together uh, when you think about how they focus towards uh, improving energy density. Now, so Mujib and I, were, were, we're great old friends, and uh, so a few months ago, I, I, I texted him. I said, Mujib, are you using a uh, high energy density primary uh, in order to get that 600-mile uh, range? And he responded, hey, I'm looking for a, uh, a VP of blah, blah, blah. Do you know anyone? <laughs> <laughs> So, By the way, best <laughs> network ever. Just pick up Yet Ming Chang's. So, yeah. so even a good, you know, we don't, he's not telling me what he's doing. Right? He's not telling me what he's doing. But I have a very strong suspicion. Yeah. <laughs> well, I in probably fact, won't get it out of him today. If, in fact, the anode-free uh, revolution is very important because if you get rid of graphite, that's a cost reduction, but it's half your factory as well. You get rid of mixing and coating and calendaring. All these pieces of equipment go out. We're paying around $100 million per gigawatt hour in the U.S. for a factory. If you do an anode-free cell, the energy density goes up by a very strong factor because you got rid of something, so you have more room for cathode, and you don't have as much equipment. Our anode-free cell, which you're correct, is what we're doing. Um, so <laughs> you found out a year and a half later, uh, is $26 million a gigawatt hour. So it's one quarter of the cost for the factory, but the lifetime is not as good as automotive needs. So we only use it for range extension. We don't use it every day. We can have 90% less life. And that's where I think this idea of putting the best of both worlds together is going to help us go faster. Because then the roadmap for chemistry development doesn't have this high bar of 15-year automotive requirements. You can be like 200 cycles, not 3,000 cycles, and still get into the automotive market. And that might unlock a much faster chemistry development effort. So he's, found, he, he's fessed up what he's doing. <laughs> Lithium iron phosphate, no anode. Yeah, right. second chemistry is no anode. Right, yeah. and that's the shorter life, uh, longer range chemistry. I knew I'd get it out of them. <laughs> <laughs> so just to add to that, there are many other uh, innovators that are in the room and in the space that are thinking about a lot of things. So I think we can celebrate. There are multiple ways to do it, and if we pay 100 million per factory in the United States, it's going to be hard for us to compete. Yeah. Uh, and I think we have to basically take it from atomic arrangements into ionic conduction and losses and yield losses all the way into just making sure we make money at this. So I think we will see an enormous amount of innovation. I think lithium ion to <laughs> ending this is going to stay for a long time. And we have only scratched the surface. We have a lot of opportunities to optimize the chemistries, the systems, and maybe most exciting to me, is the use model. How do we use it? How do we put it together into larger systems and where we deploy it everywhere? Yeah. So we only have 15 seconds yeah, left. Yeah, yeah.
So uh, for the next time we talk about this, we should talk about whether or not sodium is going to displace lithium. Or potassium, I would suggest. Right. So uh, that's the teaser. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know that was, that was truly an impossible task, but thank you. You know, you know what kills me about this battery thing is, it, Christina, you just now said, you know, I think that lithium ion has a bright future, right? And I never know, are you saying lithium ion, I-O-N, or lithium iron, I-R, okay, ion, okay. All right, it was not an LFP promotion. <laughs>